So, actually, I'd like to say thank you for being here too. Um, because when I got Alan's email, my immediate response was, that's what we should be doing. This is the right thing to do today. So I said yes. And then I thought, what am I going to say? <laughs> and I've been thinking that right until I got off the train today. Because the more I think about what the church should say in response to Brexit, the less I know. And I think that's a question that's very present for me in my role as the political engagement for the church. Uh, that I am often asked, as Kieran says, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is important here? And it is such a hard question. So I'd really echo a lot of what Kieran said about the environment that we're working in, about the change in Parliament, about the fact that people are, people are afraid. People are overwhelmed by the responsibility that they have. And they're very aware of it. And they don't know what to do any more than we do. I think is my experience of some of those conversations. Um, I think for me, this particular journey started with the work I did for the Church of Scotland after the independence referendum. And I think, again, Kieran has placed the context that we're in now in, the, in that journey of our political dialogue. And I would, I would say exactly that thing, that after that referendum, I spoke to a lot of people who thought, my, my vote counted. And it was a new feeling for a lot of people, people who live in a safe seat, where you know who's going to win the election before the election even happens. Woke up one morning and thought, I can vote in the referendum on Scottish independence and it matters. And people came out of that referendum saying, how does my vote matter now? What can I do now? I've had this experience of being in control of my destiny and I want it. And I definitely noticed a change in the political discourse after that time. And sitting in the Church of Scotland, we had a long conversation about how does the church respond? We're seeing something in the communities that we serve that's different. And we don't know what to do. So we thought, let's ask. So we ran a consultation exercise. And we asked people a question. We asked people, imagine it's 2035, which was 20 years from when we asked the question. And Scotland is a fairer, more equal and more just society in a fairer, more equal and more just world. What could the church do to make that happen? And it was genuinely answers on a postcard. I asked you to write it down and post it to us with what you thought the church could do to respond to this world that we were now living in. We got 11,000 responses over five months. So there's a lot of people participated in that process. It was hard work. I went to every tiny place saying, fill in my postcard, go on, you know you want to. Um, it wasn't all church members, it wasn't in any way contained. So we went to churches, but we asked them to use the materials with anyone that they had a relationship with. So people in parent and toddler groups, people in lunch clubs, people in the village shop. So it was the church and the community beyond that we asked. And then we came here to this very building for two days of reflection on what we'd heard. We processed it, you know, we did word analysis, we categorised and then we sat down and we thought, what are we hearing from this? And we produced seven strands of work. And the work that is relevant to us is a call to do politics differently. And it's very strong on those 11,000 voices. We think there's something in a political system that needs to be renewed. And we found in that conversation four distinct things. One was the desire for more local decision making. For the decisions that affect us as communities to be made closer to us, or indeed more by us. And it was not just more, but also better. There's a lot of negativity in that. We think some bad decisions, we want better ones. There was a disillusionment with the political process. Very strong. And if I was there in that room having that conversation and I said, what do you mean? Do you think that's about your representative? Is it your MP the person that you have a problem with? People would say, actually, no. My MP, I see their desire for community service. I see them in this community. But the system that they're a part of is terrible. <coughs> Though it is a desire to move beyond party politics, to look more at the common good, 
to look more at consensus building in politics. And there were questions about constitutional reform, which were not about Brexit in 2015, but very much a strong question about what is the structure of our society. And I look back at that, that analysis of the last couple of weeks, and I hear a lot of those words in our political dialogue today. I heard some of those words in the Labour MPs that left the party yesterday. Mm -hmm. Actually, word for word, what we wrote down in 2015. So I think the voice of the church was prescient. Dare I say prophetic? <laughs> because we could see in the communities that we work in, we could see the things that have brought us to where we are today. And I feel very strongly that good quality decision making, good democracy, is everyone's business. We can't say to the government, you're not doing very well, do better. We have to say, we're in this together. We have to say, how are we going to be part of making this better? So what is it that the church can do? I'm going to give you one quite specific example. Last year, we decided to talk to communities on the coast, in the north of Scotland, in the west of Scotland, around the impact of Brexit in their communities. And there was one particular event. It's quite a long journey to get there, I'm right in the very north of Scotland, to a tiny community. And I spent all day travelling, getting more and more worried, imagining turning up at this church. I was being hosted by the minister. He had arranged for folk to come to the event. He'd advertised. He was assuring me that he had a good turnout. People were really keen to come and talk about Brexit. And by the time I got there, I was absolutely terrified. I was thinking, here am I from my central belt bubble in one of the biggest remain areas of Scotland. And I'm going to walk into this church and I'm going to talk to a fishing community about what they think about Brexit. <laughs> I'm going to ask them personal questions. I'm going to say, what are your hopes? What are your fears? And because I'm a policy officer in my, my day job, and I'm going to ask them, what do they think the government could do to bring about their hopes and alleviate their fears? And I'm thinking, they're going to tear me to pieces. It's going to be the worst day of my life. <laughs> so I was really quite, quite cautious by the time I sat down at that table. And we had one big table. And I wanted it to be a positive conversation. We'd spend a lot of time thinking about how we manage the space, thinking about what it would look like for that to be a safe and productive, and fruitful conversation. So we started by asking people to draw pictures together of what they valued in their community. It's a lot of silence, not much drawing. So in the end, I started drawing pictures of what they valued in their community. People said, oh, you could do this, you could do that. And the conversation started to flow. And I started to ask my questions. And we got some answers. But it was quite cautious. They were clearly as nervous as I was. And we'd advertise an hour and a half event. And by the end of that time, people could see I was drawing to a close. And the minister stood up and said, right, I'll get some more tea now. And everybody sat back and started to talk, really talk, about what they actually thought about Brexit. I think we need to talk, and we need to be heard, and we need to listen. And I think until we do some of that, we can't move forward. And I think there may be a role for the church in that. It's hard. You know, and I have resources behind me when I do this. So when I sat in that room, and indeed a number of other rooms, we did, a, we did three of these events in different places, I had somewhere to go with what I heard. And one of the things I heard was about lack of representation. People saying very clearly, they wanted their politicians to hear their voices. They wanted to feel that those who made decisions understood what they were saying. And I have a way of telling someone that. Even if it goes no further, I can at least say, here's what I heard and I present it to you. And I heard a lot about identity. A lot that was specific, in fact, to the coast. About the sea. About people's relationship with that externally facing part of their lives. But I also heard people just talking, being given permission, being invited to a space that they did find safe, a space that was hosted 
by their church, an organisation that they thought was neutral and open to them and available to them to have that conversation. And I think there's something incredibly powerful in that. So I think what I'm here to do is to encourage you to think about whether there's something that you could do in your church to create a space for talking, for listening. And I would say it might not always be the right answer. We did two of these events over the summer, in May and June, and it was in a way quite easy. People came and they talked. We did the third one in November. It was a lot harder. Some people came, but not many. And they came with messages from their neighbours saying, this is too hard a conversation for us to have. We're not ready to talk about Brexit. The event was in the week that the withdrawal agreement was published. It was a very political week. I didn't know that when I booked the event. But you know, there, there was a degree of circumstance around all of this that you can't control. And that event was very much smaller and very much quieter, I would say. It was a hard day to have that conversation. There's this hard space. But I would encourage you, I think, to reflect on whether there is a role for the church in that space. And with that in mind, the, the questions that I had in mind were, what could a community conversation about the impact of Brexit look like for you? What would it be like in your community? What barriers do you think you'd find to that conversation? And what kind of hopes or fears might people have? That might be a hard question. But as I said, when I went to a fishing community, there was some space that I could predict we would step into, and I think it was useful to think of that. So what is it in your community that you think are the touch points? And do you think a conversation would help? Chloe, just repeat those questions one more time, because folks will be taking them down just so that they can discuss them later. What would a community conversation about the impact of Brexit look like in your neighbourhood? What barriers might there be to having that kind of conversation? And what might people express as their hopes and fears? Mm 